Welcome, 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 everyone. This is CK Snarks with Bitcoin Magazine. Got a good Twitter spaces all set up for you. Uh, really excited for this one. Um, it's going to be uh, it's going to be with Alex Gladstein, and we're going to be uh, talking about what is happening in El Salvador. Um, Bitcoin is obviously happening in El Salvador, but a lot else is happening there. Uh, Alex wrote an article for Bitcoin Magazine titled "The Village and the Strongman," uh, t- really diving into the unlikely story and talking about you know how Bitcoin in El Salvador became a thing uh, to begin with, but also um, you know the character of Bukele, what's happening around human rights there, um, what's happening around democracy there, etc. So it's a nuanced, complicated subject. We've been talking about El Salvador a lot here on Bitcoin Magazine, um, so. Uh, obviously, something that is very, very pertinent to Bitcoin and very big news. So, uh, want to continue to continue uh, covering this. Uh, so, we are a little early here, kind of getting the room started, um, but you know, waiting and excited for uh, Matt O'Dell, for uh, Aaron Van Wordham, for uh, several other folks to uh, to join in and and kind of lead the conversation along with uh, Mr. Gladstein. Aaron, if you want to request to come up on stage, oh, awesome. What's up, Aaron? And hey, just for everyone who uh, is unfamiliar with Aaron, he is uh, a our lead technical writer, and he is on the ground in El Salvador, and pretty much has been uh, since before the, uh, the news of the Bitcoin law, but since pretty much. Hey, hey. So Aaron, um, in between... Uh, the Bitcoin legal tender law, you know, became official at Bitcoin 2021. You went to El Salvador just because it was starting to really become a a place, uh, El Zante in particular, for uh, folks to kind of make a pilgrimage. Um, Can you talk a little bit about, you know, uh, how how El Salvador has really changed from before the, the law and after the law? as well as, uh, you know, Bitcoin 2021 and, and that kind of experience? Uh, well, you mentioned that it has become sort of a, a cool spot for Bitcoiners to to visit El Zante in particular. Uh, I've spent some time in El Zante. I've spent more time in San Salvador. I'm in San Salvador now. But El Zante has become, I've, been, I've described it as sort of like a rolling Bitcoin conference almost. Like you can go there and... More often than not, there will be other Bitcoiners in town and you can have a beer and, you know, just uh, the types of conversations you'll find at Bitcoin meetups. So that's kind of cool. Uh, I don't know what you mean with the uh, last question. In fact, I, be- I don't remember what your last question was. Um, no, I was just saying like uh, how, you know, what was the experience at Bitcoin 2021 seeing that news and how that kind of shifted how you thought about El Salvador kind of before? Uh, I'm, I'll answer a different question because I don't know how to answer that question, but uh, it, it was interesting to see how, um, I mean, so for, for us at Bitcoin 2021, this announcement came in and it was like a huge surprise for everyone. And you had this standing ovation in the crowd and everyone was cheering and everyone was happy. And then you get to El Salvador and you notice, uh, you learn that it was Equally a surprise here, but the reaction was a little bit different, I would say. A lot of people here had a feeling like, what the fuck is going on? What is this Bitcoin thing? Why do we have to deal with this? And um, so the, I did feel there was a contrast, like it was a surprise for everyone. And Bitcoiners, of course, were very happy with the surprise. People here were mostly just a little bit confused about the surprise. Uh, and um, I had mixed reactions, I think. I mean, it's definitely put Bitcoin on the map. So a lot of people are thinking about it, talking about it. That's a good thing. Uh, at the same time, a lot of people aren't necessarily very happy with the way the law is being implemented and the way it's sort of being rolled out without any public debate before the law was implemented. Um, uh, yeah. Awesome. Um, well, th- thanks for that insight, Alex. Welcome. How's it going? Is there anyone that you see uh, requesting? Yeah, we, sh- uh, we should, should get uh, Gerson and Enzo up here. They are uh, Salvadoran, so I wanted uh, to give a platform to. Uh, they have slightly different opinions on this topic, so I thought it would be really great to hear from them. Uh, Enzo Rubio would be the other one. Um, so I'll just give an overview first, and I really want to hear from um, 
from Matt O'Dell as well, and then and then we can we can get uh, Enzo and and Gerson's take. Um, Enzo, can so you request I, just so I can find you easier? Um, Go so for it, Alex. I, I sure, sure, sure. So I, I wanted to do this article um, for two reasons. One was to show the kind of mainstream media who, who you know have reached out to me about this article. Uh, people from the New York Times and elsewhere have been reading this article and, and interpreting it and digesting it. And I wanted them to understand that like, yes, on its face, this seems quite contradictory to have um, a, you know, a, a government that clearly is heading in an authoritarian direction. Um, you know, what is, you know, what is the contradiction there between that and then the fact that they're adopting a nation state currency that's decentralized and beyond their power to manipulate at a, at a root level, um, this is a fascinating geopolitical contribution that's going to have a lot of human impact, you know, around not just in El Salvador but in, and beyond. So I wanted to create something that show, showed some nuance with regard to the fact that yes, this is historic. Yeah, it's incredible that this government chose Bitcoin and not like some central bank digital currency or some Chinese surveillance coin or you know, like they chose Bitcoin as as the legal tender for the nation. It's it's still hard to think of. It's still stunning to think about. But on the other hand, like, what are the goals of this government, and you know, how will this serve them? And I think at the end of the day, you know, it comes down to the idea of self custody and the idea of like, is it going to be two million people using Chivo, which is really promises to pay Bitcoin that are confiscatable, or is there really going to be an organic movement of Salvadorans who actually, you know, like starting in El Zante, who actually learn how to use Bitcoin the proper way? And, and, you know, then it grows organically from there. So these are two kind of very contradictory um, and, and paradoxical uh, kind of uh, themes. So, you know, Matt O'Dell uh, obviously talks a lot about privacy and surveillance and, but also about government adoption of Bitcoin and the game theory of that. So I'd love to hear Matt um, and his take on this so far, and then we'll get, we'll get into Gerson and Enzo. Hey guys, uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's an honor to be here. Um, first off, uh, Gladstein, really, really appreciate you uh, going down there firsthand and, and writing such a nuanced and comprehensive write-up on the current situation. It was really helpful from my point of view as someone who has not been able to get down there yet. Uh, and one thing, I mean, I would definitely highlight that you mentioned in the piece I think a lot of Americans aren't really aware of is how much harm we've done in that country intervening and uh, forcing our will upon the Salvadoran people. Uh, so I want to be very conscious that I'm not um, being an American trope over here and, you know, giving my opinions on something that I have not been, you know, on the ground firsthand. But in general, you know, my concern stems mostly from a skepticism of government and a skepticism of large corporations who often uh, neglect uh, their user base's privacy and abuse the relationship that they have with those users and the control they have over those users. Uh, there's a lot of things that I'm very optimistic about uh, with the new Salvadoran uh, Bitcoin law. Uh, specifically what you mentioned, the fact that they can use any wallet is massive. And I think something that, you know, I did not expect to happen in any kind of country for maybe even a decade. So uh, way ahead of the curve on that. But uh, one of the things you really highlighted in the piece that I think is key here is there's a huge education element. Um, and I think Bitcoiners from around the world uh, as a community, that's something that's very actionable that we can get around uh, just in educating people in the best practices when using Bitcoin, because there is there is so many nuances when you're trying to use it privately and when you're trying to use it as an individual uh, that is not necessarily as simple as just installing the government wallet. So there's a bit of a concern here that you could have, you know, a lot of users flock to the government wallet because it gives you free money um, and it's the easiest to use. Uh, but as a result, they end up having no financial privacy and their funds can get seized at will, which is, is the current situation if, if users are using the, the Chiva wallet, the government wallet. 
Yeah, and something you brought up, which I think is very important to point out, is that currently in many countries, including El Salvador, the cash economy is very important for a lot of people. This is the same case in Palestine and many other places around the world, obviously. And it provides a level of like, um, let's say, not not just privacy, but like actually like disconnection from the, the regime and the government. Like it provides like a place that that the government doesn't have a lot of control or oversight over um, in a good way. Like it, it allows people to actually conduct business in a, in a peer-to-peer way that's much more uh, within their control. Now, if if what if this is part of a government strategy to like um, basically get people to move from the cash economy to the chivo economy, then we're then we're concerned, right? Because then all these like little transactions that are done using cash, which is, you know, of course it can be it can be debased, but like with the dollar, the Salvadorans are less worried about that. The problem is with cash, you have privacy and you have a bearer asset um, that can't be confiscated remotely. Now we're shifting potentially to people using a government digital dollarized wallet uh, that that can be remotely confiscated and frozen and and ha- and and has a lot more con- surveillance restrictions. So I think one of the concerns is that like this is part of a, a general global movement of like moving from a cash economy to to maybe a chivo economy. Now obviously, like using things like uh, you know self custodial Bitcoin wallets in developing a peer to peer economy, that's how we're going to fight that trend. Um, but it just seems unclear, you know, across the country of El Salvador, like how that's going to play out. So I have two. Matt, do you want to weigh in on that? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to agree that, I mean, that's absolutely a trend we're seeing globally. Um, we're seeing cash get phased out, uh, not only by governments intentionally trying to phase out its usage and discourage its usage, but also by individuals who are choosing more convenient digital options. Um, and I, I think Personally, you know, Bukele, President Bukele is a very savvy politician. He's a populist. He's very good at using Twitter. Um, he probably has, like most people, many motives uh, for implementing this. But I think it would be pretty naive to assume, pretty naive to assume that one of the motives isn't uh, this, you know, discouragement of of the cash economy, which he has no insight into. The government has pretty much no insight into this this cash economy that is supposedly a pretty major aspect of Salvadoran economy. Um, so I would be very surprised if that isn't one of his incentives and one of his goals is to try and people to move people over to this more digital surveilled economy. But at the same time, if you are going to do that, obviously it's strictly better that it's being done on an open monetary network like Bitcoin, where you can use uh, other applications that are not run by the government, as opposed to a lot of these so-called central bank digital currency plans we see coming out of China and even the United States. Right. And obviously, as long as the Chivo app still connects to the Bitcoin network, meaning that you can still withdraw funds into Bitcoin uh, and receive Bitcoin and Lightning payments from abroad, it's a powerful tool. And it's it's one that obviously no other government has has, has dared to implement. Um, so, and I, I don't want to underestimate uh, the power, the humanitarian upgrade that Bitcoin presents. And this is what like kind of the mainstream totally misses. Like they might be accurate in their criticisms of Bukele in a, from a political point of view, but like you have to really understand like wh- what kind of a massive upgrade that this could, this does present for people when they can receive, you know, a payment, perhaps a remittance, $50, $100, $500 from anyone to their phone instantly, and then they can like keep that in dollars without a bank account or withdraw it into cash or withdraw it to their own Bitcoin wallet. I mean, that's just such an incredible tool. Um, so I, I want, I, again, I have two guest speakers here. One's, one was initially at least more positive about the law and one was like more negative about the law. So we'll, we'll hear from Gerson first because he was more positive and then we'll hear from Enzo and and then we can kind of go back and forth. So Gerson, go ahead. Tell us about, you know, your perspective on this as, as it's unfolded over the last three months. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, thanks, uh, Alex, for uh, for first of all, for writing that article and, you know, kind of getting it into, I think, in front of so many, uh, getting the story of El Salvador, uh, uh, I think a more like a, a, a pretty you know, dense analysis of of the El Salvador's history in front of so many you know eyeballs. I think that's really really important. So let me. Uh, I, I want to agree with a lot of what you and um, Matt just said uh, with respect to uh, the importance of of this law from a uh, uh, kind of uh, 
of, from the perspective of of the the human rights aspect, right, of, of of giving people access to the Bitcoin network, in particular in a country where seventy percent of the country is unbanked um, and and doesn't have the the resources or documentation necessary to you know to open up a, a um, you know traditional you know financial instruments. So um, I've been, as you said, I've been uh, very very optimistic about uh, this whole endeavor. Look, I don't discount the possibility that a person, you know, a president with a supermajority in the legislative body and with, you know, who's wildly popular, you know, almost like cultishly popular, you know, in some pockets of the country, I don't discount the, the possibility that, you know, this, this human, this man could, could also, you know, become corrupt or right? absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Right. Um, uh, so I, I don't discount that possibility. However, I think we're all highlighting here that the monetary network that he is opting into, he's opting the country into, is one that he can't control. And I cannot stress how I think meaningful that is to me as a as a as a Bitcoiner, right? Um, because uh, uh, because at the end of the day, he's not saying we're going to go back onto the Colón standard, right? From from pre two thousand one. And I actually wanted to just, if I if you give me just a second, I, I wanted to touch on my own kind of family's history and what what has is is that okay, Alex? If I if I spend just a minute on please. Okay, cool. So I'm. I was. Uh, uh, my parents are are both from El Salvador. They emigrated to the U.S. about 40 years ago, uh, in the middle of the uh, a civil war uh, that was um, that was being fought by basically a, a really bifurcated political you know system, a far far right party against a guerrilla group um, that turned out to be the far left party in the country. But I would want to rewind the clock even further uh, than that. So about five generations ago in my family, five or six generations ago in my family. Um, uh, on my dad's side, they were coffee cultivators in a part of the country called Cuscatlan, um, uh, um, um, Cuscatlan, where they owned the land that they cultivated, right? Uh, uh, that, that they that they uh, uh, grew coffee on. Um, and somewhere in the early 1900s, a subsidiary of United Fruit Company comes by and effectively doesn't give anyone an option um, and be, and begins to buy up all the land, you know. And and you can obviously a lot of folks on this in this space can imagine these are you know multinational interests. Um, <laughs> bedfellows with uh, political leaders who give them that the, the right of way in their country, um, start buying up all this land and then telling all the farmers, you're still going to work here, but now we're going to pay you, right? Now we're going to pay you what, whatever wage we deem is, is profitable for us. So that happened um, in the, in my, to my uh, father, my dad's grandparents. And fast forward to 1957, when my dad is born, uh, uh, in El Salvador into abject poverty, right? Because their ability to build wealth had been taken from them. Um, uh, and, and, and so he was born into abject poverty and further down the line when he was 19 years old, because of that uh, civil unrest and, 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 and poverty and, and corruption in the country, you get a civil war where if you're 19 years old, you have no option but to walk out the door and pick a side, right? You have to pick a side. So what does my dad do? He comes to America, right? Because that that's the best, the, a rational actor's best choice is just to leave, right? Because he didn't want, he didn't, th those, those were bad options down there. So I'm, 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 saying all of them, I'm, I'm, you know, going through this here because I think uh, my experience here in America has been one that w we, uh, and I count myself, I'm, I'm just as American as I am Salvadoran, right? But we as Americans look at Salvadoran immigrants and just look at the, oh my God, what are you doing here, right? Or like, we, we, we can't, we're unable to peel back the layers of history and understand what propels people, you know, to come to this country. So at least in my, in, in my family's kind of uh, history, these are kind of, these are the dynamics dynamics, the underlying dynamics that drove our family into poverty and thus up toward, you know, the United States. So for me, this is coming full circle now, right? Like I went down to El Sonte in July and I can I know uh, Chimbera's on here and I, it, it gives me so much joy and pride in my heritage to know that there's young people in particular, young people, right, who are so hopeful about their 
country now, right? And 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 that the first thought isn't let me get out of here. Let me figure out how how and when I can get out of here to go look for a better life, but rather I can build the life that I want here, you know? And 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 in my view, you know, having adopted this monetary network is a gigantic step in that direction toward you know, freedom and 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 sovereignty. So, I'll I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Um and could you also just briefly comment um on like the, the, the like remittance structure, like how, like how you would normally send money and like oh, yeah. how, what, what new, new opportunities this presents here. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's very simple. Like my, you know, folks like my mom who routinely send, you know, a couple hundred dollars a, a, a month to, to different folks, um, send, they are 100% accustomed to paying, you know, 6% uh, uh, fees, right, on, 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 a, on a remittance payment of like $100, something like that, right? And this is presuming that, that, it's, that it's to a person who has a bank account in El Salvador, right? Um, so there's just this 6% transactional cost. My mom and every other person who sends remittances are just kind of used to it. That's, that's the way of the world. Well, Strike comes along and, you know, well, more specifically, the, the Lightning Network comes along and suddenly... Um, all of us are able to send those payments, first of all, and, and have them have them you know settle instantly, um, meaning the person can receive and use that money instantly um, and with 0.3 percent you know fees. It's absolutely game changing. Uh, most specifically, of course, for the for the folks on the receiving end of the of the remittance, right? Um, not only, are, is there not a, a financial cost? There, more of the m- more of the money is actually arriving. Not only that, but to the folks who are unbanked and who have to go to their you know commercial center in their town to go collect the cash, there's far less risk, right? I, I'm sure everybody on this call already understands that, right? You don't have to take three hours of, of time off of work to go to the place to collect your cash, to stick it in your pocket, and then go back home. So um, the remittance, uh, the, the ability to send remittances uh, through over the Lightning Network um, is uh, is game-changing, I think, um, for the country. Now, to something that uh, I think Matt said earlier, there's a huge learning curve for anyone, right? When any of us came into this space, there's so much, there's so, the topic is so dense, um, there's a, a huge learning learning curve necessary both in El Salvador and also I would offer here in the U.S. because there's two million of us here in the U.S. who are the ones who send the remittances, right? So we need the education here in the U.S. as well, you know, for all those kind of Salvadoran, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the diaspora, right, who's who's up here sending uh, the remittances down. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, look, and there's obviously, look, there's a tension in, Bit- in the Bitcoin space, I, I felt, between really kind of strict let's say freedom maximalist libertarians who say, you know, strike is a betrayal because it has KYC, um, Chiva wallet, you know, we should, and I, I agree we should protest Chiva wallet, but the, 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 this idea of like even something like strike, which is a private company that it somehow is this betrayal. And then on the other hand, there are like people who are like, okay, let's be practical about this. Like from a humanitarian perspective, this is a really useful tool in the same way that a lot of Americans find Cash App very useful to convert fiat, maybe their income into Bitcoin, um, even though they make the trade off to KYC, right? So right. Salvadorans are making that same decision. Um, so I think that's an interesting tension I've noticed here in the Bitcoin space. All right, Bitcoiners, I want to tell you about our newest sponsor. This show is brought to you by Ledin.io. I have been super, super impressed with the guys over at Ledin. I've actually known the co-founders, Adam and Mauricio, for a very long time. I've had the pleasure to watch them build Ledin up from a tiny, tiny startup to now a super impressive institutional grade Bitcoin and crypto lender. Y'all. I'm so impressed with these guys. They are offering some of the best rates out there. I don't think anyone even comes close to touching them. You can get 6.1% APY on your first two Bitcoin that you deposit into Ledin interest accounts, and you can get 8.5% US on USDC deposits. I mean, I know all the competitors. They're not even close. If you're going to put your crypto and your Bitcoin into an interest account, Ledin is by far the best. And on top of that, like I said, these guys are hardcore Bitcoiners and they know the products and the services that Bitcoiners want and appreciate. They come up with B2X. It allows you to put your Bitcoin in, they leverage it up, and you can, with one click of the mouse, get twice the exposure to Bitcoin. So if you're super bullish, Ledin has you covered with a super, super easy way to get leverage with B2X. And then on top of that, 
They know that Bitcoiners care about your reserves. They know that Bitcoiners don't like under-reserved and not full-reserved financial institutions. So they are pushing the frontier in transparency in the digital asset lending space. And they are the first digital asset lender to do a full proof of reserves and proof of attestation through a Mariano LLC, a public accounting firm. So the letting guys, they know what Bitcoin is like. They are legit. I encourage you guys to check them out. Do your own research and go to ledin.io. That is L-E-D-N.io and learn more. Bitcoiners, I want to tell you about the deep dive. The deep dive is Bitcoin Magazine's premium market intelligence newsletter. This is a no fluff, hard hitting, incredible newsletter going deep into the market, helping you understand what's happening with derivatives, what's happening on chain, what's happening in macro, what's happening with the narrative and what's happening with the tech. My man, Dylan McClare is an absolute savant. He is making his name known in the Bitcoin community, getting shout outs left and right, getting on podcasts left and right. And him and his team are bringing you everything that you need to know about Bitcoin. You don't even have to be on Bitcoin Twitter. You can ignore every other newsletter. This is the newsletter to rule them all. Go over to members.bitcoinmagazine.com. Sign up today. And if you use promo code MACRO, you get a full month for free. You have nothing to lose. What are you waiting for? Sign up, see the incredible work that Dylan and his team are putting out. And if you don't like it, just unsubscribe. You don't pay a dime. But if you do, you know, it's going to be well worth the sats in investment in understanding Bitcoin and gaining the confidence to continue to invest in Bitcoin and making the right moves around Bitcoin. And it's going to be well worth every single Satoshi. Uh, again, can't recommend it enough. That is members.bitcoinmagazine.com, promo code MACRO. Do it today. All right. So now we'll go to Enzo, who has a different perspective. So uh, Enzo, welcome. Enzo, before you go, I just want to, uh, you know, ask the audience, if you think this is a helpful conversation, please share, uh, tweet it out. Uh, we want to grow this room as much as possible and spearhead the com conversation, especially uh, now that it's turning a little bit more critical. But Enzo, go forward. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, my name is Enzo Rubio. I'm owner of Point Break Cafe in El Sonte. I've been taking Bitcoin since November 2020, and I'm very happy about it. Uh, uh, my kudos to Harrison. Uh, he has explained in five minutes <laughs> uh, perfectly what is going on and basically our views. Uh, I have changed from the last time we talked, Alex. I think I've changed my mind. Uh, I've been doing more research and stuff, and, and I think uh, it's a very positive thing uh, that can come out of uh, Bitcoin. Obviously, it's not 100%. It, it could cannot be like the, the silver bullet to get out of poverty and stuff. But, uh, it can help at the end of the day. What I think we are missing here, um, Everybody is complaining about the Chivo wallet. Uh, I've been playing with it a little bit. Uh, just today, only today, I, I was able to download it, but I, I have my employees downloaded it. Uh, we, were, we have been testing it, basically. I need, we need two things from the, from the government, and the main thing is education. Uh, if we don't have the, the right education to know what is going on, what a non-chain transaction is, what a lightning transaction is, uh, how the market moves and stuff, you're going, to be a, you're going to have a lot of people really pissed off uh, that they, they see their balances going down and they, they, they feel that they have been, uh, the money has been stolen. Uh, it's, it's difficult when you don't have the right education. So I think education is, is one big part that the government is not doing right now, possibly because they are, they are trying to fix the technical difficulties of it uh, more than uh, the, the education part. And the other part that I, I think the government should improve is transparency. Uh, beyond the use of everyday uh, Chivo wallet or any other wallet we want to use here in the Salvador, I think the transparency of how the government is using uh, Bitcoin is going to be key. Um, as you know, a Chivo wallet has two balances on it, 
has a US dollar uh, balance and a Bitcoin balance. It's not the same. It's like two wallets. It's different than Strike. You know, Strike, you have a USDT balance and that's it. And Bitcoin Beach, for example, has um, a Bitcoin balance that you can see in a dollar value. Chivo Wallet has a, a Bitcoin wallet and you can see the dollar value of it. And there is another wallet or another balance in the same, in the same app that is US dollars. It's not USDTs. It's not the USDCs. We don't know what it is. Possibly is uh, US dollars, but, we, but Chivo, as we know it, is not a bank. So transparency for me is important. If it is not a bank, where is the money? Who has it, right? So that is not clear to me. You um, also mentioned, Enzo, that like it's not still clear kind of who owns the Chivo company, and people have a lot of questions about that, right? Well, it's actually very clear. We know that Chivo, Chivo Wallet is owned by Chivo SADCB, which is basically an LLC, and is not uh, the government. It's indirect uh, run by the government, so it's a private company. That uh, another private company created that is related to the company, to the government, I'm sorry. So it's like a second layer beyond the government. So it's not... Uh, so far, it's not declared as a bank. It is a, um, an enterprise, basically. But it's not a bank. It's not even a financial corporation. It's just um, a company. It's, a, it's more like a, a, business, a regular business uh, right. created so to do what, what some people are afraid of, Enzo, is like, like if Chivo becomes popular among, let's say, several hundred thousand people, they're using it all the time. Those like the, whether it be the Bitcoin or the dollar balance as displayed in the app, uh, really these are just promises to pay, right? That like at the end of the day need to be uh, liquidated into, in, mm -hmm. into cash or Bitcoin. If the user just tries to withdraw the cash at a uh, ATM, if they try to make a bank wire to their bank, or if they try to withdraw the Bitcoin to their self custody wallet. So the question is going to be. What happens if everybody tries to withdraw all their money at the same time? Like, like what? Like, do they do they have the liquidity to settle that? And and that's like, I guess, another question people have, right? Absolutely. That's that's my main question. Like, if it, this is a private company, it's, that is not a bank, it's not a financial institution, it's not under uh, the vigilance of the institutions that that also check the, all the banks and all the all the, all the other financial institutions. Then. How do we know the money is there? Yeah, and Bitcoin is. A, I think it's Bitcoin is a little more difficult to to fake. Let's say like the balance because you know we we now know that we can transact Bitcoin from Chivo. Right, but it's. But, I mean, but it, but they could freeze it. I mean, it's like a. It's like your Bitcoin balance on your your Cash App in America. Like it's not. You don't have the keys to it, so they could they could easily just freeze that. Um, as I'm sure people will find out if, when they no longer can log into their account one day, maybe it's down for maintenance or something. <laughs> so I think one thing Enzo is like working on like just education to help people understand that at best the Chivo is kind of like your checking account and you really need to be withdrawing any Bitcoin that's meaningful amounts onto your own wallet, whether it be the Bitcoin beach wallet or a moon wallet or a blue wallet or whatever. So that's like quite clear. And you know, when I went and used, when I when I was a customer at your cafe, uh, uh, the barista was like extremely like adept at taking my Bitcoin payment. I mean, way more so than <laughs> probably anybody in Silicon Valley. So the the question is, how long does it take for for staff to become comfortable taking Bitcoin payments? I mean, how many months did that take you guys? Or, or you said that when <laughs> when Jack Mahler's visited, you got a lot of exercise because he was coming like three times a day, right? Um, so how long did that take you all to get familiar with this? Uh, it was pretty quick. Uh, kudos to the Bitcoin Beach guys. Uh, they did a pretty good job. I think it is just excellent how things were working before the law. In El Sonte, it was just easy. I think um, the Lightning Network makes it makes it uh, possible. Without the Lightning Network, uh, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't work because uh, nobody is going to wait 10 minutes or even a day and pay up to 24, 25, you never know how much fees to pay for a cafe. But with the Lightning Network, the thing is that you can see it instantly. And it was pretty quick, actually. 
it took us maybe two days. I wouldn't say no more, no more than 10 transactions to understand at least how to, <laughs> how to create the invoice. So, so we have this phrase, uh, Enzo, that um, in, in America called the bigotry of low expectations. So basically you have a lot of people in New York City working at like the New York Times or whatever, and they say, Bitcoin's too complicated. No one will be able, no one will ever be able to figure it out, right? Okay. And this is basically in a way, it's kind of racist. It's basically saying, oh, like people in emerging markets won't be able to figure it out. And I, ju I would just urge people when they're like reading the media in the newspapers to understand that, that that's not the case. And that in fact, they're literally like, forget the Bitcoin law in El Salvador. I mean, they're like 10, they're probably close to 10 million, if not more, uh, if, you, if you include India, uh, probably close to 20 million people in emerging markets using Bitcoin right now. Uh, whether it be in Argentina, Turkey, Nigeria, I could go on and on. Um, and they figured it out just fine, probably faster than the people in Silicon Valley because they actually understand what it is. Um, so I just wanted to make that comment. I'm not sure if you have a reaction to that. And so, Yeah, absolutely. I think we have to uh, make the, to, to, to separate what is for a, a, a regular people, people working in the street, uh, using, using the Lightning Network or Chivo Wallet, whatever, like using Bitcoin, and what the government can do by using Bitcoin. I think on the day-to-day -day transactions, uh, all the pedestrians, I, it, it, it's going to be easy to understand at the end of the day because if they just, just use one wallet and they do uh, Lightning payments, I think it's going to be really easy to understand. Uh, if you give the proper education and the proper education, I, I, I'm not saying that you need to send these people back to college, right? I think everybody gets smart when it's related to money. So once they understand and they feel safe having money in their, in their phones, in, the, in these apps, uh, it's going to work. What they did in, in El Sonte, the Bitcoin Peak Sky, was the right way to do it. Uh, it was a circular economy. So they were giving, they were hiring people, paying in with SATs, and then uh, convincing other uh, businesses to take those SATs. And for me, that was the key. So everybody understood. Uh, as I said, as a, as a pedestrian, like someone walking on the street, it was really important to have like instant payments and it was all value in dollars. Uh, so I don't, I don't see any difficult in that part. I, I saw uh, Aaron, um, awesome that you're here. I, 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 you know, I, we all, a lot of us saw your video that you made of um, you kind of operating one of these ATM, Chivo ATM, and then having a friend abroad pay the invoice. Have you thought about that some more and kind of zoomed out and thought about what that could mean moving forward? Like what kind of, what are the possibilities here around like basically the idea that anyone in the world could pay an invoice in El Salvador instantly versus like the legacy economy? Well, well, so first of all, it wasn't even a friend. It was someone on Twitter that I have no idea who it was or what his real name is. So that actually right, makes right. it even cooler if you ask me. Um, yeah, well, as you saw, that went smooth. That went even smoother than I expected because usually, well, this is maybe a tangent, but usually you get like a, printed out thing and then you have to come back when there's a confirmation but this time it was instant so yeah that was super cool that someone was able to send me 20 bucks from i don't know where in the world almost inst instantly and i think it cost like 20 cents just a transaction fee now of course one of the reasons it is cheap and that's a more complex topic is because the government is subsidizing the conversion Right. It's not like there is some cost. There is some friction behind the screens that the government is paying for that it's subsidizing and uh, getting back to, I think this was one of, uh, was it Gerson who made this point or maybe it was Enzo. Sorry. I don't remember that. There's not a lot of transparency on anything from the government. I would know that, but the fact that it's working is obvious. Uh, what was even cooler in my view is that I went to the McDonald's and took a photo of the QR codes on the on the payment terminal, and then someone in the Ocean paid for my Big Mac instantly over Lightning for a fraction of a cent. Now, if you don't recognize that this completely changes the remittance game, then I don't think you're paying $3.50 uh, 
and there was no cost and I'm having food on this side of the ocean paid for by someone else. And this, this just completely changed. The whole concept of remittances is, is a like a dated concept at this point. It's like talking about long distance calls. You know, no one does yeah, long distance and- calls anywhere. We, we just use Skype and, and that's this for payments. If you don't recognize that, you're not paying attention or not being intellectual. And Aaron, honest, what's your what's your take on this tension between like people who want lightning to be entirely, you know, parallel, non-custodial, permissionless, and they feel like anything beyond that is a betrayal. Uh, we're, we're getting a lot of this. So you're, you're breaking up oh, completely. Okay, hold on. I'll be right back. Why end or Go ahead. is anyone else hearing Alex? Yeah, actually, I think it may be potentially uh, Aaron that has the uh, internet issues, but um, <laughs> yeah. Alex just left. Yeah, Alex Aaron was breaking did, did up from me. What his question was? Aaron, what about the thought around people who believe that, you know, Twitter is about to add in, you know, the near future. I mean, we have confirmation from their product head. Um, they're going to add Lightning. And it looks like it's going to add, uh, it looks like it'll be through Strike. So there's some Bitcoiners that are like, this is bad. This is a betrayal. And there's others like me who are like, oh, that's like a really useful functionality for people who already are KYC'd or maybe are a nonprofit or a business and they want to receive payments from anywhere in the world instantly. So what's your take on this like tension here? Oh, you're basically asking if I see a problem with building closed systems on top of an open system. Exactly. That's what the question like, like comes down it, to. Them. Like is it, you know, we're going to be recreating a lot of traditional systems, they're just going to be connected with Lightning instead of with Swift. I mean, you know, I guess I find it hard to see why that's a downgrade, but I mean, and Matt, I'm sure you have thoughts too, Odell, but I'd love to hear either of you on this. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously not ideal, but it's also better than nothing, so it's hard to complain about it. Uh, I mean, as a European, I cannot use Strike, so from at least not right now, so for me, something like this wouldn't be accessible. Um, I guess it's sort of, you know, you're, you're seeing a similar problem with the internet itself, where the internet itself is maybe, you know, at least has the potential to use it fairly anonymously. Uh, but then on top of the internet, we've, or take email for an example, you could run your own email server and be very anonymous, but in reality, everyone's using Gmail or Outlook. So, uh, everyone's emails are being read. And yeah, it, I can definitely see the argument that it would be a problem if we're moving in that direction with Bitcoin as a whole. And we have this flow services on top of Bitcoin that everyone's just using instead of running their own node and instead of having their own uh, lightning wallet on the phone that, that's anonymous. Um, hey, a- Alex. Matt, what's your take on that? Gershon, you want to jump in real quick before I go? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Thanks, man. Yeah. No, I was just going to offer that maybe like when I think about it, maybe it's kind of like I think about it as sort of a continuum, right? Like um, uh, many of us would never have bought known how to buy Bitcoin if Coinbase didn't exist. We all agree that there's gigantic, you know, uh, uh, risks involved with holding any sort of coin on any sort of exchange. But it was the on ramp for for huge swaths of adoption, right? So while we know they are, you know, these closed systems are problematic, I kind of tend to think of them as part of the learning continuum for for everyone that's coming into the space. I am not a technician, right? I'm not a a person who 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 could physically technically buy Bitcoin back in 2012. I just didn't know how to do it. I don't have the skills to. So similarly, I guess there's I, I think of it as 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 sort of a continuum. Um, I, I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, Gershon, I tend to agree with you. Uh, in general, I think that we really want as many options available to Bitcoiners as possible. Um, Alex mentioned Twitter adding strike uh, functionality. I think it's important for people to realize it's a bit tangential, but it's important for people to realize that it's not really them adding lightning. They're adding strike. They already support Cash App and Venmo and I believe PayPal. So they're adding like another payment processor there. Hopefully they add more native lightning support in the future. Um, but in general, these ideas, you know, lightning is, is very new technology. Um, hopefully we have easier self-sovereign tools that protect your privacy that are open source, um, that make it more convenient to use Bitcoin in a more sovereign way. Um, unfortunately we're not fully there yet. So a lot of these band-aids are being put on in terms of custodial services. Uh, the biggest issue with custodial services is twofold. Uh, one is custodial risk, they can steal your money or they can lose your money. 
um, which is uh, historically throughout Bitcoin, there's been many cases of custodians losing your Bitcoin and, and people having less money because of it. And then the second reason, um, which I think is almost even a bigger reason today, in America and in a lot of places in the Western world, these custodians, because they're trusted third parties, they're forced to implement KYC and regulations on their products um, by the governments that host them. Uh, and as a result, there's little to no privacy. If anything, it's the opposite of a private wallet. You know, it's a, a surveillance wallet as a result. Because El Salvador is going full on into Bitcoin, it could end up in a situation where custodians aren't necessarily obligated to have these very, um, you know, very inconvenient and poor privacy regulations attached to them where they have to accept all this personal information. Um, it's a little bit early to know if that's going to be the case. I mean, it seems with Chivo, it's mostly a phone number is my understanding. Um, I correct me if I'm wrong on that, but one of my big concerns here is in general with, with people, uh, we, we live our lives choosing decisions based on a convenience versus privacy security trade-off. So we oftentimes will choose something that's more convenient, that is less private and less secure for us. If, if Chivo gets to play by different rules than other projects in the space in El Salvador, um, it is going to be the most convenient option because it has the government's blessing. And as a result, more people will use it and its ability to uh, abuse the privacy and the sovereignty of their users grows as, as they have market share dominance. And I mean, Enzo mentioned that Chivo LLC uh, that is like the company behind the wallet. I'm pretty sure we don't even know who the owners of that LLC are. Like who is the controlling interest behind that LLC? Are they going to get favorable treatment over other projects? And that's like, for me, that's a, a thing that we should all be watching to make sure there's no abuse there. So to be clear, ahead, Matt, the, the, AT, the ATM is phone number only, but the actual application is just, you know, full name and everything. I can go. I can give my opinion here. Um, yes, the Chivo wallet. Um, you need your ID, so you they they take pictures of your ID, and I believe the the U.S. dollars balance is related to your to your ID number, and the Bitcoin is a lightning a lightning address. That's what I have to say. So, um, and yeah, again, just like. Look, I was talking with Aaron a few days before <laughs> the implementation, and like I, I think a lot of us like were very skeptical that the wallet would even ship with Lightning. So it is kind of remarkable. And look, uh, you know, from a different perspective, there's no way my government would ever roll out a, um, you know, some sort of social service for its people that had Lightning on it. That is like not obviously not going to happen. Our, in fact, our government is openly hostile to such an idea. So I think we have to think a little big here. But one thing that I will point out, and Enzo can help color this, is that like Bitcoin is not a silver bullet right now. There, there are two quite important functions that it that it does not fulfill natively in a you know self custodial non KYC way. Now it might fulfill these in the next few years. There's like roadmap. Uh, there's things on the roadmap that might get us there, which would be amazing, which I'm I'm paying attention to. But the first one is that at the end of the day, people need dollar people need dollarized balances for now. Uh, we're not there to the point where like Bitcoin is, you know, less risky than the dollar for most people. So they need dollars. So something like Strike, even though they make the trade off to KYC or something like the Chiva wallet, the fact that they can like have the Bitcoin value pegged to the dollar is very, very important. Now, it's possible that like in the next few years, you'll be able to have a non KYC, non custodial Bitcoin wallet that can actually peg natively to a dollar. This is something that people are working on. But it's not here yet. So until that is here, we need to be open minded to the fact that people, especially in emerging markets, like it's very important for them to have dollars. This is demonstrated by the fact that many countries, Tether is very, very popular, like Lebanon, Palestine, etc. The reason why Tether is very popular is because it's a less regulated dollar that people can get their hands on without a U.S. bank account. So th this is something we need, just need to be pay, like pay attention to. The second feature is a tip page. And obviously, when Carla, who works with Enzo, was able to receive a lot of tips uh, from the video I made, that was only because I was able to paste a tip page. Um, 
in my, you know, in my tweet. And, you know, there, we just, we're not there yet with like what are called offers, I guess is what the industry is like, uh, coalescing the, the, the jargon around soon enough, you'll be able to pin a QR to your Twitter profile and receive lightning payments from anybody and uh, without hurting your privacy. Um, but we're not like there yet. Like, I think we're actually fairly close, but like, until we have like, like if Enzo, if you can think about it this way, imagine if you can go into your moon wallet or Bitcoin beach wallet or blue wallet, like forget something that's even custodial like strike and generate a QR from inside of it and then paste it onto your Twitter page or put it out in front on your store. You can just be receiving lightning payments in a way that's, that's totally self custodial and protects your privacy. So I think offers are huge. They're just not here yet though. So until we have offers and until we have like basically stabilized like non-custodial lightning accounts that can be pegged to fiat, people need these partial solutions. So, you know, and I, I think that it's naive to and kind of you live in a bubble if you don't think that's the case. So that's just something I feel quite strongly about after doing a lot of research in emerging markets. But I don't know, Enzo, what's your reaction to that? Well, the, telling the story of Carla is, is great. I tell um it's amazing to see her. You posted that video and then sent a link, and then she received lots of money from different people. And we even had visitors just wanted to meet her, to know who who she was, and they they were so happy about the Bitcoin barista. Now she's the Bitcoin barista, and now Point Break Cafe is not even Point Break Cafe; it's Carla's Cafe. Um, and it, and it was great, uh, and it works. It was fine. I do agree. That, I, I, I don't know how to stress this enough, but without Lightning, things wouldn't work the, the way uh, they are working right now. Day-to-day uh, -day transactions, uh, if you're walking on the street and you want to buy something, you need the Lightning Network. I mean, you need instant payments. Some people would say that we need another blockchain or another, another cryptocurrency or whatever. But I believe uh, what we have with Lightning right now works. I know it has some deficiencies. Uh, it's better to focus on how to fix those deficiencies than, than, than to think on, on a whole new solution afterwards. Well, I guess uh, what I'm pointing at, Enzo, is that like there is a technology potentially on the horizon where someone could go up on their phone and they could type in uh, the amount for their coffee and then just like scan like a, a static QR code that you guys would just have sitting on your counter. And you would never, you wouldn't have to even prepare an invoice. Like that's kind of coming, which would be very interesting, it, right? No, it's right here. It's right here. We, yeah, Bitcoin but, Beach, they can generate a QR and I can post it on my Twitter account and people could actually send right, me, send me some payment. That's on chain. No, no, it's a uh, lightning. Yeah, it's a we, URL, we URL that will take you to a website and right, there right, right, like right, the right. invoice no, no, is generated. I'm saying like, we, what I'm saying Enzo is in the future, we're even gonna be able to cut out all those other steps, but we're yes. not quite there yet, which is why the stri the strike tip page, you know, is helpful for now. And the fact that strike obviously keeps your balance in dollars. You were telling me that like, you know, people like prefer that for now, like maybe they want their tips in Bitcoin, but like not everybody's comfortable going all the way over to Bitcoin, right? For now. Yes, um, I can tell you my experience for this morning. I was walking in Puerto de la Libertad, it's the biggest town near the, the beach. And uh, there's a, a huge line of people on the, the Chivo ATM cashing out. Um, people, I think it was, it's going to take a few months for people to get used to have uh, money on their app and not, not wanting to, to cash it out. But right now there's a lot of people in all the ATMs, uh, Chivo ATMs around, uh, just trying to cash out the money. Hey, we have our friend here from uh, OpenNode. Uh, if he wants to weigh in, that'd be great. Uh, I'm hey going guys. to just add one thing. Uh, I'm going to sure. try to pass the QR, my QR code uh, because I'm pretty sure you can send some some uh, sats there. Uh, I'm pretty sure. So I, I'll post you on that. Sounds good. Hey, I was just listening to you guys. I'm not sure if I listened correctly. Were you guys talking about the McDonald's user experience where you get redirected to the website? No, we were uh, not. Oh, we were talking about the lightning case. We're actually, the strike tip uh, page and the B Bitcoin Beach wallet tip pages. Oh, uh, I see. Because on that, we they're testing right now to print actual deadline invoice. So any wallets uh, will just scan and be able to read. Um, so that's pretty cool. Nice. Awesome. What's your take on this? You you you're, you know, you guys were involved in some of the integration with some of the merchants. What what's your take so far? 
Honestly, this happened very fast. Um, to be honest with you, we were not even pursuing the the market. Uh, these big companies came naturally, organically to us because there was no kind of other solution at this point with our like track record. So then we started investing more in the market, and as you guys probably saw, we have like pretty big corporations there using our product. Uh, there is a lot of stuff that we can't talk about because they don't want to be yet uh, tied to us. So that's the only issue here. Uh, <laughs> so I can't can really give disclose. any insight. Can you give any insight in how many people are paying with Bitcoin over here? Yeah, I can say like uh, our biggest client is definitely a telecom there. And the biggest use case is remittances. And what I can say is that the number of payments in LN in general grew six six times uh, since we added them. So comparing to what and, we had and before. Do you have any do you have any absolute numbers by any chance? I have, but I can't disclose. Uh, too bad. So Sorry. so your take is if you had to say now, would you say that things are moving smooth more smoothly than you thought? Or like or or you know, what's your take in general on, on how things have been going? Mm-hmm. I think the Initially, when we started talking with these big companies, they had no idea what Bitcoin was. Uh, so there was definitely some education part there, understanding how the system works, especially on the fraud part. They don't understand that this is not like a bank account where you can tie your identity, etc. So it was hard in the beginning to like make sure that everything was according to their procedures, right? Um, but it was kind of forced, right? We all know that. So eventually, uh, they... They had to comply and not, especially the big companies had to have Bitcoin since day one, which most of them did, but they just didn't announce. Cool. But, uh, Thank you. Regarding um, the wallet, honestly, the most problems appeared when, but based on Shiba wallet, right? Um, things were not working in the beginning. Uh, these big companies were pissed off because Shiba wallet couldn't pay our invoice, you know. That's when things starting to escalate a little bit because <laughs> they want to, uh, in their in their mind, they want to get the biggest pie possible from the 180 million, right? As a company, you're trying to get that money. Um, so that was definitely an issue in the beginning. Um, eventually, uh, we understood that the, the Shiva wallet was not reading the codes correctly. So we adapted on our side and so did other companies. Um, there were still problems with Shiva wallet. Well, there was... Yeah. There was also the issue that the third thirty dollars in the Chiva wallet could only be spent to other Chiva Correct. wallets, right? Yes, and we even had a couple of the companies saying uh, we are integrating now with Chiva with the Chiva merchant thing because we want those thirty dollars, right? That's their goal. Um, so yeah, so for so for context, just to make this clear for people that don't know this, so everyone got thirty dollars, every Salvadoran got thirty dollars in their Chiva wallets if they downloaded the Chiva wallets, but then. The restriction was, and this was the goal, was to you know incentivize people to actually use the Chiba wallet for payments rather than just walking to an ATM and cashing it out or whatever. So they had the restriction that the first payments could only go to other Chiba wallets. This first thirty dollars could only be spent to all the other Chiba wallets. Once it was spent one time, so after one hop, then it was sort of free to be spent to other Bitcoin wallets or to cash out or whatever. But the first hop could only happen between Chiba. So this caused a huge mess because a lot of people, like you said, walked over to McDonald's to buy a burger and then they found out that they couldn't. Meanwhile, McDonald's put in all of this effort to get these $30 from people. They knew everyone's getting $30 to spend. Let's make sure we're ready on day one so everyone's going to come to us to spend these $30. And then because of this restriction, which was not announced ahead of time as far as I know, the McDonald's was pissed off apparently and rightfully so because people couldn't spend their thirty dollars there. People were confused because they thought they were gonna be able to spend the thirty dollars and they couldn't. So they had a bad first experience with Bitcoin. It was just a complete mess that they put this restriction on. In my opinion, it did more harm than good. Bitcoiners, let's take a break from the content and I want to tell you about Coolbix. Coolbix is an awesome Bitcoin hardware wallet that has been around for a really long time. They are building an amazing Bitcoin wallet called the Cool Wallet Pro. The Cool Wallet Pro is state of the art Bitcoin hardware wallet technology. Its form factor is like a credit card. You can put it into your wallet and it is designed to go with you 
on the go. So that way, even when you're on the go, you can have the benefit of a two-factor uh, hardware wallet design when you're trying to spend your Bitcoin. So you can have your Bitcoin uh, wallet uh, UX on your phone and make it really easy to scan, decide what you want to do. But then you sign with a cool BitX, which is in your back pocket. It is tamper proof. It is waterproof. It is flexible. It has an awesome secure element in it. And it is a really awesome way in order to have some more flexibility, yet security when you're taking your Bitcoin on the go. I personally am a fan of, you know, this idea of making Bitcoin into a medium of exchange and making it into something that people use. I know it's going to take time, but they are working on the UX for making that possible in as secure a way possible. So uh, have some peace of mind. Check out the Cool Wallet Pro from Cool Bix. Uh, and yeah, thank you to them for sponsoring this podcast. Bitcoiners, I am so excited to tell you about the Bitcoin 2022 conference. You guys, Bitcoin 2021 was absolutely a smash hit success. It was over 13,000 Bitcoiners coming together, breaking the barriers on who can come together and celebrate freedom, celebrate Bitcoin, and the energy was absolutely electric. Unfortunately, it was just oversubscribed. There's just people flowing out everywhere. And this year we are learning, we are making the conference bigger and better. We are moving over to the Miami Beach Convention Center, and we are going to be throwing a massive four-day festival for Bitcoin, celebrating Bitcoin, bringing together the greatest minds in Bitcoin and the greatest businesses in Bitcoin. And lastly, the culture of Bitcoin all together. We have a four-day extravaganza planned for you guys for Bitcoin 2022. Uh, day one is going to be industry day. It is a day where you can buy a special ticket in order to uh, just mingle and make business deals happen. Day two and three is going to be a full-blown Bitcoin conference. This is our main conference. This is going to be on April 7th and 8th. And then lastly, we have the Sound Music Festival day four. Imagine going to Coachella. But for Bitcoin, there's going to be very few talks. It's going to be all about the culture of Bitcoin. It's going to be all about hanging with your fellow plebs. It is going to be an absolutely amazing time. There's going to be Bitcoin musicians, Bitcoin artists, and all your favorite Bitcoiners and just an amazing environment to party and just see it all, soak it all in, and to get people to realize that a Bitcoin world, a world filled with Bitcoin people doing Bitcoin things is the world that they want to live in. That's what Bitcoin 2022 is all about. That is what the Bitcoin conference is all about. That's what Bitcoin magazine is all about. So it is going to be a celebration of Bitcoin, the Bitcoiners, and this amazing movement that is going to make the world a better place. Go to b.tc forward slash conference. Learn more about the Bitcoin conference. Learn more about all the amazing things that are happening in Miami around the Bitcoin conference and buy your tickets. And guess what? If you buy your bit tickets with Bitcoin, you save $100 on all the tickets and $1,000 on the whale pass. So if you want the VIP pass, the, the big kahuna, if you buy with Bitcoin, you save $1,000. That's a lot of sats. So go and do it right now today. Don't wait. Prices are only going up. This is going to be a can't miss event. Can you, uh, can whether it's Aaron or, or anyone here, um, I know that the government said the other day that you could, you'd start, you'd be able to start topping up your Chivo balance with a credit card. Is that, is that possible now or not yet? What I can tell you, maybe someone else can answer that specific question, but I've been playing around with the Chivo wallet quite a bit and I, it's basically not working. I would say, uh, you, it's maybe Chivo to Chivo works, but if you want to spend I've been trying to make lightning payments or on chain and either the wallet is too buggy to do anything with it, or it won't even start. It does start and the payment won't work or, I mean, they, they released unfinished software and so, yeah, but I don't know about topping up. I don't know. Maybe someone else has a, has an answer for that. Yeah. Not sure about the topping up, but regarding the reliability of the wallet. I mean, our payment volume is definitely increasing day by day. I think that's because there is more people um, joining or getting the $30 right. So it's definitely better than before. I can assure you that. Uh, but there are still issues. And the problem is we don't know who's in charge. We can't talk with anyone that from their technical team. It's very, it's like everything is a secret, you know, so that doesn't really help. It's not like I have a GitHub page or anything like that. It's very contradictory to the open source spirit of Bitcoin. 
for what it's worth, I know if you go to AchievaWallet.com, there is a page dedicated to basically it seems like a remittance flow where you can pay with credit card to any Chivo user, but I haven't tested it myself. Yeah, yeah. So again, I think you have like the traditional uh, modernization of remittance, um, you know, alongside open Bitcoin experimentation. Um, and this is a good moment to just reflect also on the fact of the lack of transparency and the fact that the government is doing this very secretly. I brought Simon up here because I wanted to hear from him. He's Venezuelan and obviously he saw his, uh, his government um, go through a, uh, a very sad uh, erosion of democracy. And I was actually down in El Salvador with him and he saw some of the things, same things that I saw. So it was just interesting to hear him from a Venezuelan perspective, comment on what's happening. You know, we've talked a lot about the village, but let's talk about the strongman for a second. Like, what, 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 uh, what, what's your perspective from, from, you know, a regional perspective of what's going on with Bukele and and his political opponents and things like that? Yeah, thanks, Alex. Hey, hey, everyone. It's it's interesting, right? It's it's a, it's he his party's name is Nuevas Ideas, which means new ideas. But you know, he's following the exact same playbook that your typical what ends up in a right-wing uh, dictatorship uh, looking like, right? And so you, you know, I, I think you, you posted a thread or you, or you shared a thread in, in the previous days, but it took Bukele two years to dismantle most of the country's institutions. Uh, and that took Chavez in Venezuela, I think, six to eight years. So when we were there, uh, you, you know, you and I were together in El Salvador, we were seeing the erosion of these institutions in a pace that you know ha I, I've never seen or experienced before. In the sense that, uh, you know, from from one day he had he published a law uh, basically saying that any judge above 60 uh, should be removed, which was one third of the country's ju judges. And then two days before the Bitcoin law, um, the the government uh, basically. And the government combined with the Supreme Court, which he had taken control of a, a few months prior, and posted that, uh, you know, not posted, but in, in basically posted a position that said that uh, Bukele could get reelected. So, you know, not, all, not only is he going through the same uh, erosion of institutions, but now he's already able to be reelected. This is changing from you know the single term to the to two terms, but it we we know where this is going, right? So every change is a minor change, little by little. But when you look at it in in the addition, uh, it's it's very clear uh, that that there's a there's an authoritarian government that yeah is, yeah exactly. But it's it's worth pointing out, Simon, that it's not. It's very different from like a like a chat like he's not going to be nationalizing stuff as much. It seems right. He's not really like a like a chavista kind of. Uh, kind of nationalizer, right? It, it doesn't seem like he is, but but he's he's also been you know in different parties along his life along his life. So yes, he's acting right now like a right wing, uh, what what you would call the right wing authoritarian, which eventually ends up usually ends up in a militarized economy with you know r significant reduction in freedom of speech uh, and freedom of expression. Uh, and so what, what ends up happening, and, and I think we were discussing this, which is a, an interesting clash of, you know, wh when that ends up happening and he is, let's say, freezing his opposition's bank accounts uh, and, and trying to jail everyone that is, um, that is in opposition of him, what happens then when the, the opposition has access to Bitcoin, right? Because now you, you, you can control them through the Chivo wallet, which is, I think, Part of the, the the government's plan is controlling the the financial movements of the people through the Chivo wallet, but you actually you know instantiated legal tender of a free and open source money. So now people the opposition can get donations and they can pay merchants as of right now uh, and pay people in the country with open source wallets. And so it'll be interesting to see if if and when that happens, whether the government closes in on only uh, the use of the Chivo wallet as as official and. Right. And I think um, this is why it's so important to spread knowledge about uh, Bitcoin self-custody. I, I spoke on the phone with the editor of El Faro, which is like one of the kind of fierce independent newspapers exposing government corruption in El Salvador. And not just Bukele, but like his two predecessors were helped, you know, 
Alfaro was like helpful in getting rid of two previous presidents who were very corrupt. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're, they're kind of like always just, you know, trying to figure out what the government is doing. As And I think they share a similar stance in some ways as as what, what Matt O'Dell said earlier, just, just general skepticism of government. But here you have a situation where like they don't ha have any good knowledge about Bitcoin itself. And, you know, I'm sure Enzo has seen this in the local media, but like, What's kind of sad is that like the opposition, um, you know, doesn't have a lot of resources and doesn't really understand what Bitcoin is. So, you know, one of my goals is to try and make myself available to help run workshops or seminars or uh, do things for civil society groups or the local independent newspapers. Like I'd like for them to actually understand how to use this tool just in case they need it. I mean, look, it's the writings on the wall. Um, this government has expelled journalists. And it is not out of the question that they start going after uh, the media in a more aggressive way. Um, we'll see. One of the most interesting things here is that what, you know, the freedom opposition, right, what they need to do is actually lean into Bitcoin rather than, you know, stand off it or oppose it, which is what they're doing. But that's really counterintuitive. Um, to add to that, I, I want to give a shout out to you, uh, because before this even happened, you wrote Bitcoin is a Trojan Horse for Freedom. Um, and that seems like very prophetic um, now that, you know, we are like six months after that, that actual article. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the meme has always been that like some dictator is going to adopt Bitcoin for selfish reasons. And then it, as it turns out over the years, it's it backfires because it gives more power to the people. Um, and, you know, that's what I thought. I honestly, I thought the first government to adopt Bitcoin was going to be like a rogue regime or something. Uh, a U.S. ally that was a partial democracy and a dollarized nation was not on my, like, uh, let's say short list. But uh, it, it is what it is. So, M Matt, do you have something to say? Um, I mean, we might have had one of them uh, start using Bitcoin already. They just don't talk about it. Um, but one of the things I wanted to talk about, and I don't know if this is too tangential because we haven't discussed it yet, but one of the controversial things here. Uh, is this this Bitcoin law is is forced legal tender where everyone needs to accept Bitcoin? Um, I, I think you and Simon made an interesting point um, that you know a, a lot of our a lot of our work that at least a lot of the work that I've been doing helping activists in different parts of the world uh, the one of the major issues with them harnessing the power of Bitcoin and accepting Bitcoin to donations globally is what do they do with the Bitcoin once they get it? And, you know, whether or not it was Bukele's intention, uh, the fact of the matter is, is opposition in El Salvador now can easily spend that Bitcoin on goods and services at any merchant throughout the country. And they can use those those ATMs to get dollars out um, with only a phone number, which can be a burner that they paid for with cash. So that is a massive improvement um, for opposition that you know, is, 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 the, is the single biggest pain point uh, when we see other other opposition groups around the world trying to use Bitcoin. I think yeah, I think something similarly ahead, with remit, sorry, uh, similarly with remittances too. It, it's exactly what you're saying. And, and Alex has been harping on this point. But now the, because it's, for, you know, it's, it's not forced. It, it's forced in the sense of the law. The law gives a workaround whether you're not, you know, technology ready to, to accept it. And, and that's the debate that's been happening. But from the remittances and from the spending, this is actually solving the last mile problem, which is usually, like you say, Matt, it's the last, uh, it's the it's the biggest problem with with Bitcoin so far. So by in by the, you know whether or not the ATMs are working fully uh, or not, just the fact that they exist and they're going to get better and better. Uh, Yes, I, you know, I, I don't particularly like that their government provided, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, and, and, and of course, they, they should they should work and they do with more than just a Chivo wallet. Uh, but it's it's a huge, huge improvement uh, for the, the citizens and eventually uh, for the opposition as the government starts cracking down, which for me, it's an it's an when, not an if. Gerson, and, do you want to go ahead? 
Yeah, just a quick, um, just a quick uh, uh, comment, and I think Enzo would probably, you know, would probably have even better, you know, better perspective on this. But I think that like uh, we're we're seeing a lot, and just in in my own kind of family and 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 friend group in El Salvador, the uh, the, the a lot of the opposition, you know, you see the the no al Bitcoin kind of uh, uh, symbol everywhere, and the 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 notion of of uh, protests against Bitcoin itself, I think, is misdirected anger and frustration at, you know, the strong armedness of the government, um, then, you know, being deflect, you know, being turned around and directed at Bitcoin itself out of a lack of education, right? So going back to the point about, about, about awareness and education in El Salvador, about this freedom money, right? About this, this money that can be the, the, this ability that you now have to custody your, your, your property, um, I, I think boils down to a lack of of education. I, I, of course, I understand. You know, there's so much opposition to Bukele's administration and and his tactics and the direction that he seems to be going in. Um, I just think that um, that it's uh, uh, then gets gets redirected or gets branded as anti uh, Bitcoin. To be clear, like whenever you talk to informed opposition, they will say, "We're look, we're not against the software. We're we're against the way it's being rolled out and 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 the government." Um, and I think that they're going to learn about it. I mean, I, talk, I was talking to a journalist who's in El Salvador who reports against the government, um, as any good journalist should do. Um, and he was like, yeah, I mean, look, we are realizing that this is not going to like go away anytime soon, and, and we need to learn more about it. So hopefully the Bitcoin community is willing to you know, reach out and, and be a resource uh, for a, a people that you know, may may need to learn about how to use Bitcoin to be to achieve financial freedom in a different difficult environment. Right, right, agreed, agreed. No, yeah, I think I was just, I was just speaking more to the 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 regular person on the street who isn't, uh, as you as you put it, you know, an, an informed, a super informed person about the technology. They kind of just tend to tether to their traditional, you know, if they are Arena or FMLN, they'll go with the party line there with respect to being well, anti. I, I was also talking with a friend of mine who. Um, was in one of the chats. There's spaces every day almost uh, with some of the opposite, you know, kind of, let's say, informed opposition in El Salvador, yeah. like uh, educated uh, technical people. And it seems like the there's a little bit of a shift from like very intensely negative everything about Bitcoin to, to more like acknowledgement that, oh, my God, it's going to be around. So maybe we should learn how to use it properly. And I think yeah, that's okay. that's a really good opportunity for those of us who can to get in and help where we can. Um, one other just take I had that I'd love to get this panel's input on was kind of a, maybe it's a galaxy brain take, but when I was down there looking at the Chivo, Chivo ETMs in the airport and thinking about, well, who's actually going to be buying Bitcoin, right? Like I'm thinking about, okay, there might be remittances coming in in Bitcoin and tourists might be coming in with Bitcoin, but are, is there going to be like a demand for Bitcoin, like from inside the country, like for now, uh, it takes months or years probably for people to get comfortable you know, converting their their fiat in large amounts to Bitcoin. So, one of my like concerns, in a way, is that like essentially what you're going to have is the government is going to be taking the Bitcoin, whether it be from remittances through Chivo, um, or through spending from people like us when we go visit or whatever. Um, we're happy, you know. Pe some people want to like some people like the convenience of being able to withdraw cash without having a bank account, et cetera, et cetera. And they're going to be like stacking Sats basically. And meanwhile, they have the people using this like app, which is a kind of a promise to pay Bitcoin or dollars. And I don't know, there's like something interesting in that. I'm not sure if someone has a take on that, but I was it's sort of like what the Cuban government does. The Cuban government prints this like peso, which is like a like a worthless de de depreciating currency. They pay all their public sector workers and their pensioners with it. And then they force people to buy things in stores with hard currency from abroad. Like my suspicion is that in the next few years, they'll actually allow you to buy with Bitcoin as well, because they're going to want to stack that too. So I'm just curious if people have thoughts around this idea. I've noticed that governments uh, tend to like to scam, and uh, it's a very convenient scam you can do on the internet. It's definitely an interesting dynamic that you mentioned this live scene, because if, if you look at worldwide Bitcoin ATM usage, uh, usually governments make it extremely hard for you to sell Bitcoin at an ATM. So uh, like Athena, uh, Athena Bitcoin, who's running the Chivo ATMs, is my understanding. The majority of their ATMs are probably 
the, the majority of their business is by Bitcoin only. But I tend to agree with you that in El Salvador, it'll be the opposite. Uh, yeah, I mean, did Garrison or Enzo, I mean, do you have thoughts on, I mean, don't you think that most of the usage at first is going to be people probably like probably selling some of the Bitcoin that they get? Yeah, as I said, like people are making huge lines uh, in front of the ATM just to cash it out. I think it's, uh, as you say, like uh, Herson said, a uh, key word that is misdirect, misdirect anger against the Bitcoin. I don't. Th I think the more people research on what Bitcoin is and how to use it, the, the less uh, the less barriers it will have. And um, so I, I think it's extri strictly that it's my my misdirect anger and poor education so far. The, the fact that it's, it has been uh, imposed and not it has, has been adopted, it's a different different situation. Right. And, and Garrison, before you go, I guess, let me just boil this down. What I'm describing is a new kind of state attack that I think we'll see in the future, which is governments printing fiat um, as salaries or, you know, some sort of credits for the population. Um, and in exchange, you know, the, they're, they're stockpiling Bitcoin. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. That's maybe like down the road. I think I think that's do I think that's possible. Well, they can't ahead, print Aaron. dollars here, though, Alex. Go ahead, Aaron. They can't print dollars here, so uh, they print they can't Aha, print dollars, they right? Can print the, so uh, they can print Chibo balances, a hundred percent. What if Chibo balances become the uh, they, way they do fractional reserve, right? Uh, Alex. They can if people hold their balances in Chibo balances and trust it equally to the dollar, which I think are two ifs. Big, Big ifs, ifs, but I but mean, if the government it, it, can do it, I mean, that gives them a way to print dollars. I want to raise my hand here. Uh, yes, that, that's what I, who I am. I was telling you about the two balances that Chivo Wallet has. Uh, one balance is Bitcoin, and the other balance is in USD. Uh, and I'm, and I'm not meant that the Bitcoin balance is expressed in dollars. It's just a different wallet. It's like having a two pockets in the same wallet. So, so yes, what what it could happen that maybe tomorrow that Bukele can say that he's paying uh, all the teachers uh, on their Chivo wallet on exactly. US dollars. Instead of via their That's bank what, account or in cash. Exactly. Uh, exactly. So oh, so people would say, well, at least it's dollars. But we would, we because we don't have the transparency, we wouldn't know where those dollars are if they're backed up with real dollars. Yeah, meanwhile, we, we wouldn't know. meanwhile he's to complete the thought, he's yeah. taking the money that he normally would pay them or the state would take the money it's normally paying workers and is buying Bitcoin with it. I mean, he just bought the dip today. Does anyone know where that money comes from? I mean, we know, like, yeah. it's not even clear whether it came from the initial loan that they got um, earlier. So I don't know. Go, go ahead. Sorry. Which, by the way, this is exactly what the Venezuelan government is doing with the Petro in a much more sketch, like in a, in a much sketchier way. Uh, but but still doing that right. So they're paying Venezuelan government, the Venezuelan government is paying pensioners and other government workers in in Petro, which is a, not even a cryptocurrency. It's just a way for them to to print any any form of money that isn't. But tied that's to what the, the Chivo dollar balance is. It's not a cryptocurrency. It's just a promise to pay dollars. Yeah, I yeah, mean, exactly you right. could say the same. So I think. You know, so Alex, you're you're essentially tapping into one of the maybe you don't realize this or maybe you do, but you're tapping into one of the big debates within the Austrian School of Economics, which is is fractional reserve banking even possible? Uh, because you know one side of that school will say it's not possible because once something like that would happen and people learn that it's happening or suspect that it's happening then the sort of digital currency will start to trade at a discount versus the actual dollar. And then the other side says, no, it's actually possible. And that's sort of the side you're, uh, well, you're, I, you're I supporting a, here, yeah, it sounds I mean, like. Getting, I'd uh, love to hear um, Zhao from you as well. But I mean, look, the fact is a lot of money gets created by private corporations. That's how banking works today uh, in many ways. Um, so that's what you'd be seeing here. But it's just the idea that the government could essentially the, the real difference from before, though, Aaron, would be that the government could say now, if you are a public sector worker, we're going to be paying you in Chivo, as opposed to like the banking system, which is more regulated, right, and more tied in to the Fed and to this like life flow of dollars from the U.S. This would be like a parallel system that they've created that they could pay people into that isn't necessarily backed by anything. Right, but my point is that would only work if people actually trust 100%, the digital dollar 100%, equally. I agree. You know, they they would have to value it equally to the regular dollar. 
which which I suspect they won't if this would actually happen. But you know, like I said, this well, is sort of one of the open Simon? debates. What's happening in, in with, the... what are these pensioners in Venezuela who are being paid in petro? Like what? Like what's the black market rate for the petro? Like versus what they're supposed to be being paid? That's a that's an interesting question. I I I need to know more about it. I I don't like, know. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, I'll tell you, Aaron. To your point, like you're right. In Cuba, like the government is still paying people in pesos, but the and they're claiming that the value of the peso is 24 to the dollar. But you go out to the street, and it's 70, 70 to 75 for a dollar. So you're right, you're exactly. Right. So we we will see. Um, anyway, go ahead. I have I have two comments here. Uh, one is that people is offering like on the street, you can you can sell your 30 dollars in chivo for 25 dollars in cash. Uh, on the street, you don't need to go wow. to the ATM. There's already people. Just, there's already people around the city centers and uh, doing that. Right, but I think I think the reason for that is mostly that it's that's just an educational. Easy. That's also partly an educational. I think the kind of arbitrage to which will disappear. Like as soon as people realize they can, they can right. withdraw that into Bitcoin, it gives it more power than than or into cash at a Chivo ATM. I think once those uh, things start well, working, the, maybe they don't work right now. Yeah, it has a lot to do also with that first hop you need to make, which I mentioned earlier. So this is sort of a way for people to not have to bother with that and just get cash in their hands. And for the convenience, they're basically paying five bucks. That's my read on that. For sure, but it's cre it's creating a behavior. I think is what where Enzo is going for, uh, which is like it's sure. you know. <laughs> Zhao, did you did you have something to say as well? I was just saying regarding the fractional reserve, I feel, I feel like they're already doing it right now, right? They're giving the $30 worth of Bitcoin, but they don't own all the Bitcoin for that. So, Right. And I think they're assuming that, look, I, I, again, again, this seems like this could be a scheme. And look, this is why we're here to be critical. Like, again, I think we're going to wrap soon and we want to get some final reflections from everybody. But um, I want to be clear that, like, from my perspective, this is a historic thing. It is the march of open source software. It is remarkable that this government chose Bitcoin and not like, again, like not Bitcoin, like they could have banned Bitcoin. Like I, and, and it really puts the pressure on a lot of institutions internationally and corporations to get with the program. Now that Starbucks in San Salvador can accept lightning, why can't one in Dallas? I mean, th there are network effects here that are incomp you know, that we, we can't fathom um, that are going to change the world. And the fact that they, it all came from a small village in El Salvador that doesn't even have paved roads or bank accounts is really just extraordinary. And I don't want to like distract too much from that. It's really just such a powerful thing and really an inspiring, unlikely story. And, and that's what I tried to capture in my piece. But at the same time, we have a government trying to take advantage of it in different ways. So I'm glad you all joined for this conversation. I think we should just keep having it. And Hopefully we can help Salvadorans understand that if it's not your keys, it's not it's not your coins. So maybe maybe we'll start with Matt and then we'll go we'll go around and each share like some concluding thoughts here. I just wanted to uh, thank Alex uh, and the rest of the panelists uh, for joining for this conversation. I truly enjoyed it. Uh, it's a very important topic. I want to thank the audience for also joining and listening. And um, I think. Uh, you know, this is a very important moment for El Salvador. It's a very important moment for Bitcoin. It's a very important moment for the world. And I think we should all step up and try and do our part to um, help make this process as, as smooth as possible, as, as positive as possible. And to any Salvadorans listening to this right now, if I can do anything to help, uh, don't hesitate to reach out via Twitter, DM, Telegram, Keybase. Um, all my contact information is on my website, matterbell.com. Cheers. Thanks, Matt. A Aaron, do you want to go? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, as far as final thoughts go, I, I would definitely encourage any software to not use a Chiba wallet. Use it as the free 30 bucks app if you can get it out and then start using an actual Bitcoin wallet, both for ideolo ideological reasons. Well, it's not even ideological. It's the actual important reasons like privacy and holding your keys. But also because it actually works. Uptime. Uptime, yeah. Like I said, because it actually works, the regular Bitcoin wallets as opposed to the Chivo one. Um, but um, yeah, in general, very interesting to see what will happen. Uh, the, the success of this story will, at this point, really depend on Salvadorans actually using Bitcoin or not, 
or just getting the thirty dollars out and ne never look back. So that will be interesting to see. That's something we're going to see play out over the next couple of years. Great, uh, Zhao. Do you want to say a little something here as we conclude? Yeah, just keeping uh, Aaron's words. Try to move from Shivo. Uh, they're getting better recently, but uh, not your keys, not your coins. Um, what I can say from our side, from what we're seeing, people are using Bitcoin specifically for remittances. Um, McDonald's is cool, but we're seeing most of the traffic coming from remittances. We're talking about values over $100. And we know they're coming from Shivo or out because when Shivo was down, these payments stopped mostly. So people are using Bitcoin, maybe not uh, with the same values of the dollar, but they're starting to learn about it. And it's definitely, uh, I think it's definitely keep growing and uh, hopefully uh, it's, a, it's a new inbound uh, of money possibility for El Salvador people. Thank you. And Simon, maybe you want to say something? Sure. Thank you for having me on. And I, I think it comes down to two things. It's about uh, education, first of Bitcoin and education then of non-custodial. So first, you know, it, you can't, you can't get to the non-custodial part of the, of the, of the explanation of what is Bitcoin until you really understand Bitcoin first, I think. Um, I see Roman here, Chim Chimera, who is a Bitcoin Beach um, you know, a co community organizer and leader. Uh, and the work that he's been doing for the past four years, educating people, uh, you can clearly see the people at Bitcoin Beach now get it uh, and they're empowered to now spread that knowledge. Uh, and, and this is not, you know, this is a, a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, we can't um, expect that things will work out as 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 we want them to on, on day one. Uh, yes, this is an authoritarian government forcing it down on people. Uh, but this, you know, it, it, in my mind, this is already a success in the Bitcoin story in that it just helps spread uh, spread the, the the Bitcoin virus in a way, um, and and it's working on its own. It it doesn't follow uh, anyone's control. Uh, and, and we'll continue to see its growth as we educate more and educate more on the non-custodial aspect of it. So if you have, if you can support what uh, Roman and Bitcoin Beach uh, and other types of, uh, uh, you know, educational activities are doing, let's scale uh, that those uh, those initiatives and then let's spread awareness on non-custodial once that initial work has been ha has been done. Terrific. Garrison? Um yeah, thanks, Alex, again, for hosting this uh, space and for giving me the, the opportunity to come in and share some thoughts. Um, I would just say that just for, uh, from my perspective, you know, this is a country that has been ravaged for 250 years, first by an empire north of it, and then next by a bifurcated political system. So I know that these this new administration is not optimal. It's not perfect. Nobody is. Um, but I know that everyone on this call does, you know, can, can fully appreciate how important this step is, not only for a people who have been, you know, stolen from and, and had their had their resources siphoned out of the country, but for the rest of the world, right? In particular, for those folks who have been subject to that kind of a, a financial oppression. So um, again, thanks so much for the, the space. Let's keep a close eye on the administration. Let's continue to educate folks on non-custodial ways to hold your coins. And um, myself also, if I can do, uh, if I can be of any help to anyone um, uh, in any way, both here in America or in El Salvador, please uh, shoot me a DM. Great. Enzo, you get the last word. Oh, thank you all. Thank you all for having me here. I think it's very important that we spread the word. Definitely, I agree with everybody. Uh, education is key, but I think education at the end of the day is going to be peer to peer. Uh, and the most we, the more we use it, the more people will learn uh, and and be confident about it. And then, as Salvadorians, we need to ask for more transparency. What's going on behind Chivo, and where's the money? As you say, uh, who? Uh, uh, not your keys, not your coins. I wonder where are those 700 coins? Who has those keys? How do they decide? Where to, where to keep the, it, the how irony to move is they it. Could, they could make it public and they could actually have a kind of a proof of reserve thing, which would be even more transparent than any other government in the world. Then they could do that and you should press yeah. them to do so. That would be interesting. I think that's, that's for Salvadorians to push, to have more transparency. I think it's really interesting. And then um, any dark future we can we can see or we can predict can be avoided by Bitcoin. As at this point, like we, if we have enough education on how to use it, Anything that anything dark in the 
any outcome dark that could be uh, happening in the future can be avoided if we all use the uh, open technology. We don't need to stay with Chivo. Uh, though uh, the law say, have some advantage over Chivo. But Chivo has some advantages on law. But I think every, the more we know about it, the more we can avoid it. Excellent. Thanks, you. Thank you all for coming. My last word would just be that you should check out the incredible work that um, Jorge and Chimbera and Mike Peterson have done in El Zante. It's extraordinary. You should definitely go visit and see how you can contribute. It's an incredible community that existed, you know, long before Satoshi Nakamoto came onto the scene, and and they'll exist after if anything bad happens to Bitcoin, and they'll continue to keep building what they're building. Um, and as a last thought, I just thought it was so interesting. It's so interesting, you know, as someone who doesn't speak Spanish uh, natively, uh, that we're all talking about this country that's the first country to adopt Bitcoin, and it literally means the savior. And that's uh, just something that I, I'll leave for your food of thought as we as we uh, as we continue on our Monday. And, and thanks, Bitcoin Magazine, for for hosting us. Take care, everybody. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Alex, for writing. Everyone who has not read Alex's amazing uh, article, just going over all of this in detail and kind of chronicling, um, I highly recommend you check out the pinned tweet at the top. Um, so go check that out. Read the full article on BitcoinMagazine.com. Go and look up Bitcoin Beach and Bitcoin Magazine. We've been chronicling it for several years now as well. It's been an absolute amazing story. Uh, and then finally, I encourage everyone to go check out Bitcoin 2022 b.tc forward slash conference we have four different tickets we have a lot of announcements coming it's happening in miami alex will be there odell will be there all the open node guys will be there several people who are huge in implementing bitcoin in el salvador will be there so uh I encourage you check that out get your tickets while they're still cheap be a part of bitcoin history this is where um obviously the announcement from jack mahler's happened as part of el salvador's history so um that was amazing to be part of but everyone check that out and again thank you so much to everyone listening and who joined follow everyone on stage read alex article peace thanks everybody cheers thanks guys <laughs>